Hello, everyone, and welcome to Accessibility Talks. Accessibility Talks is a monthly virtual meetup where we come together to discuss topics around all things website accessibility. Each month, a speaker will present an in-depth accessibility topic to the group, after which there'll be some time to ask questions and discuss. If you have a question for our speaker today, please post them in the chat window or tag them on Twitter with the hashtag AllyTalks, spelled A-1-1-Y-T-A-L-K-S. I'm your host, Carrie Fisher, and this month we are super happy to have Hayden Pickering as our guest speaker. Hayden will be talking today about prioritizing accessibility. For those of you who are veterans to the world of website accessibility, you probably already know a lot about what Hayden has contributed to our field. But for those of you who are new to the field, let me take a quick minute to give you some more background on our speaker. Hayden is essentially one of the grandfathers of UX accessibility design and development. He's written and coded a ton of useful things, including his, I have to plug it here, inclusive design yeah. book that I highly recommend. Um, and if you don't like killing trees, there's an ebook version as well. Uh, and he has a blog series called Inclusive Components, and his latest GitHub repo is called the Inclusive Design Checklist. And if that wasn't enough, Hayden writes and edits for one of the most popular web design blogs in the world, Smashing Magazine, and works with the Pasiello Group, focusing on accessible user experience design. So welcome, Hayden. We're very happy for you to be here. Hi. Yeah, well, thank you for the great intro. That was lovely. <laughs> Just go straight into it. So this is a new talk which I've been working on, um, which I'm going to be giving um, hopefully a few times in 2018. Um, but you're all guinea pigs, uh, and so it's quite raw, um, uh, as the Wu Tang would say uh, at the moment. So uh, I'm just going to jump into it now. It starts by me asking something that I don't think I, I never dreamed I'd ever actually ask anyone, or let alone several people at the same time. Um, or not ask, but to say, um, and that is, I want to talk to you about Taylor Swift and uh, specifically taylorswift.com. And I found out about this a while ago, um, a few weeks ago, uh, a guy called Alex Hearn, who works for The Guardian and, and writes about tech there, um, shared this on Twitter. Um, he discovered that um, taylorswift.com was going into uh, shall we say a really interesting design phase um, and uh, I'll show you what I mean this is this is what it looked like um, uh, a few months ago I guess and I know what you're probably thinking and you're probably thinking there's a slide missing or my uh, I've stopped sharing accidentally or something like that but that's not the case this is actually what taylorswift.com looked like um, for a few hours or weeks it was just empty, it was just void, there was nothing there whatsoever. It was just this black page, no interface at all. Um, the, my first thought when I heard about this from, um, from Alex was that it was kind of derivative um, because Metallica had already done the all black thing, although they kind of failed to do the all black thing because they managed to include their own logo and one of those curly Confederate racist snake things in the uh, bottom corner there. Um, and of course, they stole the idea from Spinal Tap, who did the uh, who did the entirely, literally black album. Um, and as they put it, there was none more black than that. So this is sort of tradition of doing uh, entirely black things in um, in music, I guess. And Taylor uh, is is part of that lineage. Um, around about the same time, I discovered. Um, one of these uh, sort of games, you know, these political matrix things where you plot authoritarian against libertarian and left against right. And there's uh, there's a sort of the original series version and then people sort of applied it to different kind of popular cultural things. And someone did one which was about music. And so, for instance, in the top right corner, authoritarian right would be, I guess, someone like uh, a uh, Nazi punk band like Screwdriver or some awful shit like that. And then in the bottom left, libertarian left would be uh, primitivist nine hour long bongo jams um, by some hippies or something like that. And the interesting thing for me was that in the center, uh, center top um, area, they'd simply written 
ideally silence, but in reality, Taylor Swift, which I thought was great because, yeah, I prefer silence to Taylor Swift personally, um, not being a huge fan. I'm more of a Napalm Death fan than a Taylor Swift fan. But then that got me thinking that maybe the people who were responsible for taylorswift.com were actually uh, kind of doing their audience a favor and saying, look, we can prove to you that there is actually a better alternative to the, to the noise and the uh, bleatings of, of uh, Taylor Swift's music. And that is nothingness, it's emptiness, purgatory, whatever you want to call it. But I suspect that wasn't their, their main agenda or that wasn't really their intention. Because if that was just their intention, just sending the user, sending the, uh, the browser, the client a black page, um, if that was all they were doing, then it wouldn't be 300 kilobytes in size. Um, or at least I thought it was 300 kilobytes. I actually discovered that I had Privacy Badger running, which was blocking loads of stuff. And actually, Taylor Swift's web page was 800 kilobytes. Uh, which is a lot considering it's just literally a black page. Um, to put that into perspective, the computer game Populous, uh, in which you literally uh, play a god who um, decides the fates of several autonomous and sentient beings, so quite a complex concept, uh, is only 512 kilobytes, so it fits comfortably on one floppy disk. Uh, and the game Frontier Elite 2, which, um, which is a game uh, wherein you fly around an infinite um, universe of planets and stars and uh, uh, submerged in a uh, three-dimensional phantasmagoria, that is uh, just 720 kilobytes. So, um, you know, you get a lot more bang for your buck for less code. Um, Taylor Swift's site, on the other hand, is just nothingness. Um, of course, if the universe was devoid of matter entirely, uh, then playing Frontier Elite 2 would be a little bit like this. You would just see uh, black, and that would be an easy, easy game to code. But that's not really the point. Um, one of the funniest things about it that um, Alex uh, discovered was that the part of the code that actually made the screen black was some um, embedded JavaScript, um, which just did a uh, document body style with a background color of hash zero 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 and there's some premature optimization here which is that it's encapsulated in a immediately invoked function expression which isn't needed because there's no way that you're actually going to redefine document as a variable or it would be very foolish to um, and since it's the only thing it actually does that affects the user experience then why would you go there uh, and when you think about it um, if JavaScript isn't running, then the user literally gets the opposite experience, which is uh, a white screen rather than a black screen, literally the other end of the spectrum. So there's a lesson there to do with you know, not relying on JavaScript for doing stuff. But I digress. Uh, the rest of the 800 kilobytes is all just ad trackers, just ad trackers all the way down. Um, and um, and this kind of made me sad and it kind of made me think about the state we're in in terms of uh, the global economy, I suppose, in that um, we're at this point where we're asking consumers to go somewhere, to log on, go to an address, to experience literally nothing so they don't get anything themselves. And in return, they have their identity stripped and someone makes money out of their presence. So it just seems really sort of unfair and uneven. And that's what got me talking, uh, got me thinking about uh, priorities and priorities in terms of the way that we design things. So here's one rule, and uh, it's kind of a universal rule when it comes to design and development. We can't do everything that we want to do because we have certain constraints. We have budgets, so we don't have infinite money. Um, the money will run out at some point. So that's gonna, gonna hold us back. We have time frames, so we don't have infinite amount of time to do things. Of course, when we're designing stuff for ourselves, like we're doing that redesign for our blog, which goes on forever and ever, then it kind of is an infinite time frame. But uh, we never finish, so there's a problem there anyway. Um, and we have limited resources in general, staffing and technology and, and all sorts. And of course, we have friends and family. I mean, if we're lucky to have friends and family, 
Um, and we have to do things like, you know, sit next to them uh, and watch them whilst they eat and, and, um, and, and make conversation. Uh, so we have to do, you know, we have other responsibilities in our lives aside from coding. So we can only do so much, but the problem is the things that we seem to have chosen to do, uh, I don't think are the important things. We've got our priorities wrong. We've got them the wrong way around. There are signs that you may be working in an organization or you may be working in a way uh, wherein uh, your priorities are, are out of whack. And I'm gonna talk about some of those signs. They're sort of litmus tests. The first one is if you spend an inordinate amount of time discussing the relative merits between these two shades of red and depending on the quality of your monitor, of course, you won't be able to see uh, whether there is a difference there at all. Um, so much resources and time are spent on having those kinds of things and treating those, those kinds of discussions as if they're important. And you get bonus points, of course, if you try and justify what is essentially just um, uh, piffling around <laughs> Uh, with uh, unimportant design decisions like that, uh, with some sort of psychology. So you would say something like, well, the muted red, um, I believe we should go for because um, it creates more trust in the brand or maybe the more vibrant red because it's more energetic and it fills the, um, the user with a urgency or something like that. All complete bullshit. And from a more sort of technical standpoint, we say stuff like, Ultimately, re-implementing the application in CycleJS is a net benefit to the user because it's intrinsically reactive and functional nature and makes my experience as a developer more ergonomic and therefore my productivity higher. Um, if we're honest with ourselves, we really just want to play with the new toys, don't we? We're quite happy to completely re-implement something which was in, say, Angular into CycleJS without there being any change, discernible change, um, for the user. Um, we but then we post-rationalize it and say, well, actually, no, um, I think in one way or another, and we get really tenuous, this actually is it, 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 it's a real important reason for doing this, and it really helps the user. We're, we're looking out for the user. And, of course, we do things like this, where we present information in bad ways, um, using the wrong methods, and, and reduce the amount of information because we're worried about clutter. Um, because we care more about how things look and how tidy they are than um, how good they are at, uh, at actually explaining what's going on. So this really would be better. You have permanent visible labels and then you use a placeholder for what it's supposed to be used for. But that's not what it looked like when the designer, the graphic designer, who isn't an interface designer, created it and uh, inscribed it into a static scamp so you treat that as gospel and you do that instead because your priorities are wrong and of course we enshrine even the simplest of web pages and apps in these monolithic architectures filled with bloat and much of that bloat um, affects the uh, the um, how you uh, how you're able to consume their content on the on the client so there's a performance problem but also we just treat everything generally as if it's not a uh, something that's uh, that's ephemeral most of the things we do are ephemeral life is short and these projects we work on disappear and so we spend far too much time worrying about trying to make these things immortal when actually we should just make them usable for the time being so i guess what i'm saying is that we spend too much time paying lip service to putting users first, um, when actually we're serving ourselves and then we're trying to justify it. We're using users first as a, and trying to work that in after the fact, um, disingenuously. Performance is one example. So performance is a really important thing, of course. Performance and accessibility are both parts of inclusive design, They're both really important parts of inclusive design. So I'm big on performance, performance is great. But we go about it um, in two different ways. Uh, one way is just busy work, as far as I'm concerned. So it's just, well, we're doing a performance thing. We're making a difference in one way or another. We are, we are affecting things. And then there's real work, which is we're actually making a big, big impact. We're making real proper decisions and actually having to compromise in other areas in order to make it more performant. Um, CSS selector performance is, is a kind of a busy work one, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so much time and energy has been put into 
uh, thinking about CSS selector performance and studying it and worrying about it. Um, ben Frame did a study not so long ago, which more or less just concluded that in modern browsers, uh, if there was ever a problem, even in older browsers, that now it's really not something that you would you would you would care to worry about. There are bigger fish to fry, or bigger priorities to have, and yet we still continue to study it and worry about it and write blogs about it. Here's how you measure selector performance. Uh, so first what you have to do is get about six million DOM nodes and put them all on one page. Then you heat up those DOM nodes to about 300 degrees C. Then you apply the worst CSS selectors imaginable, like stuff that no one has, has written since 2004, like really huge chain selectors. You put this all into an older browser because they're the only ones where you would be able to measure this stuff at all really. And then you fire all of that shit around the Large Hadron Collider. And then if you're lucky, you'll get a small sign that there might be uh, something measurable there. So you might be able to see a slight difference between the amount of time that it takes to pass, say, a qualified selector like A dot class or a, uh, a child selector thing. Um, but the point is measurable doesn't mean something matters just because something's measurable. It doesn't mean that it matters. And we seem to get that wrong a lot of the time, I think, um, which is a shame um, because it means that what that tells me is that we're no good at prioritizing, essentially. Um, and whenever I talk about this kind of thing, people kick back and they say, well, if you are making it more performant, even if you're making it a tiny bit more performant, an interface, then that's good, right? Because, because you're not making it less performant and you're not doing nothing. But the point is that that's not a good argument. And the reason is because you have budgets. You don't have all of the money to spend on doing this kind of research and this kind of performance tuning. And you have time frames, and you have limited resources and your family and friends probably want to spend some time with you if they haven't already uh, abandoned you because you spent too much time uh, doing uh, piffling coding uh, experiments. So you have to prioritize. You have to choose where uh, where um, doing performance tuning will actually really make a difference. So for instance, a low priority would be filling all engineering and having data and charts to stick on your blog, whereas a high priority, actually making things more performant for the user, putting them as, as a priority. So you have to ask big questions and difficult questions to, in order to do this. You have to make compromises. jQuery, for instance, nothing wrong with jQuery, not dissing jQuery, but for a blog where um, very little JavaScript, if any, is needed, you shouldn't need to depend on a sort of an, uh, between 50 and 80K library in order to do a couple of uh, uh, very basic interactions. You should be able to just do that in vanilla JS and get rid of that dependency. But of course, if it's more ergonomic for you to use jQuery, then maybe you choose that. But that's serving you, not the user. And of course, images, it's not really kind of scientific and kind of engineery feeling or anything, but just using less images. I mean, compressing them and lazy loading them is good. But just just the over reliance on images, especially raster images, is, is a big problem. And it, and it actually causes a genuine performance hit. And cost as well, because of course users um, on mobile who are downloading large images are actually having to pay for them over their network. Here's a question, why do they call it a hero image? And the answer is because the user says, thanks for the pointless 500 kilobyte image, you're a fucking hero. So getting rid of hero images actually would um, make a difference, but we're reticent to do that because then we're actually seeing a visual difference in the way that something's designed. Uh, and we have to get used to and, and more comfortable with compromising over things like that. And it's an easy compromise to make really, because actually all the hero images usually is a picture of a desk, which is the desk in front of you already. So I don't need to be reminded that I'm looking at a desk with a computer at it. So what's the fucking point in that? So get rid of hero images. Some images of course, actually add to the user experience and they help usability um, and internationalization sometimes in terms of in terms of icons because icons uh, don't belong to any particular language and um, they cross barriers in that sense and making little um, little icons which are just generic shapes if you use vectors you can make them really really small so they don't they have very very little impact on performance 
Um, I made a set of these on Twitter the other day just to sort of prove that it's possible. And things like this, this is a menu icon. It's a tiny little bit of, of, of markup, essentially. Same with a check mark, same with an arrow, which is really super tiny. Um, and of course, it, you'd need to add things to these to make them accessible. So uh, for instance, with the SVG, you can have roll text and then area label of right, if in the context right was the correct label. Um, but there are different ways of doing it. You could have um, a title element and then you could um, refer to that from the um, parent SVG and label it that way. Um, or you could actually add a text element inside the SVG and maybe um, use a class to visually hide it if you didn't want right to appear. So these are all ways of doing it and they're not difficult ways of doing things. But um, you won't know how to do those things um, unless you learn it. I mean, it's certainly not more difficult to do accessibility than it is to do to learn JavaScript and, and, and know the intricacies of, of closures and tuples and things like that. It's probably a lot easier. But the reason that people find it hard and don't want to get into it so much is because they haven't prioritized it because, because it's, it's not something they already know. Pixel perfection. This expression winds me up because people still use it like we're doing graphic design, not web design. Like we're, like we're not making things for a huge diversity of different devices and things like that. Um, let me tell you a story about a, a project I did a little while ago. Uh, well, it was, it was months ago now. Um, and what it was is we were, we were employed to make an app to help people in the UK um, do well in interviews where they're assessed um, to, uh, to get one of these two benefits, the ESA or PIP benefits. So basically, um, people who are, who are disabled or, or otherwise um, uh, unable to work, um, they, um, they should be entitled to certain benefits. I'm happy to pay taxes to support those people because it's not their fault that they can't work, right? So you have these kinds of benefits. Um, but the interview process is kind of, uh, um, kind of tricky and there's not really very much information on how to go about it. Um, and we don't want those people to be badly assessed and, and, to, and to walk away without benefits that they, they really should be entitled to. So we um, created a little app um, which helped them go through the process of the interview. So it was like a quiz and it sort of asked the typical sort of questions that they might be asked. So naturally when we're building an app like this, we did some user testing and we were careful to make sure that, um, that if there were any, anyone who was going to come to the testing session was in a wheelchair, then of course we'd have the, the, the session downstairs. But um, no, one, no one was due to turn up um, who, was, who was in a wheelchair. So, um, we booked a room um, because it was easier, which was upstairs. But what we hadn't bargained was that um, actually some people have invisible disabilities whereby using stairs can be really, really hard anyway. So we had um, one guy turn up and it took him five minutes to get up one, one flight of stairs to get up to the user testing room. So that was kind of um, unexpected. Um, and then when he would got to the top, um, it took him another 10 minutes to catch his breath because this was a really, really exhausting thing for him to do. To look at him, you wouldn't realize. So I learned something through that process. Um, the first thing I learned was that, well, invisible disability really is a thing. Um, and I should have known that because I've suffered from anxiety and from depression and those things can be debilitating and they can very much um, stop you from being able to do the things you'd like to do. So we made a bit of a mistake there. Um, but I learned other things about this guy. Uh, he uh, not only had very limited energy, but he'd actually spent most of the last 10 years of his life off the grid. So he, he didn't have a computer. He um, wasn't really in contact with anyone, at least not in any sort of mediated or digital way. Um, and the handset he brought with him, and it's important that we asked people to bring their own um, their own devices, because uh, that's kind of like a user testing or uh, usability testing rule, I guess. Don't force people to use a machine that they're unfamiliar with. You're testing the app, not, the, not their ability to use a MacBook or whatever. Um, but anyway, he had only that week 
um, got himself a mobile phone. Uh, and it turned out he'd never had one before, and he certainly never had a smartphone before. So, bearing all of that in mind, bearing in mind that he was um, very limited, limited in energy and really not familiar with or very uh, interested in technology, how many fucks do you think this person would have given about some of these features? For example, subtle, subtle drop shadows around the buttons. You know, it's very subtle. It's a certain color. It has a little bit of a warm hue to it. Uh, no, you know, no fucks given about that. Golden ratio based typography. He may or may not know about the golden ratio principle and the mathematics behind it. He certainly didn't need to have an interface which had typography based around the golden ratio in order to achieve what he wanted to achieve through the application that we were building. And lifelike animation timing functions. Bouncy, um, cubic bezier based animation functions which make it look as if um, it's really a bouncing ball or button or whatever it is that's being animated. Um, just like Disney. No, he doesn't give a fuck about any of that stuff. Of course he doesn't. Because real people aren't looking to be delighted or engaged with the interface itself. They're not fetishists like us. They're not people who actually fetishize interfaces because that's what we work on. They're not looking for immersion either. They don't, well, they don't want to be stuck inside this experience for a long time. They want to get it over with because they've got other things to get on with because they have limited resources, time frames, and of course they have, if they're um, lucky enough, friends and family to do things with as well. So it's important and it should be a priority to make things accessible. And what that really means is to make it broadly um, att an attainable experience for as many people as possible. And of course, it should be a priority to make it usable, um, as in whoever those people are and however they access it, it makes sense and they can actually get through it, you know, and it's clear. Everything else really is frippery. Um, I always think about this in terms of, if you take it to an extreme in the other direction, I always think about the idea that maybe if I'm trying to buy train tickets, that instead of it just being an easy experience I can just get through and get done, they go the other way and they try and turn it into this immersive thing where there's, there's cut scenes and animations and, and lifelike um, mathematical plumes of um, steam smoke or whatever. Uh, it's, I'm obviously not interested in that. I don't even like traveling by train. I mean, trains are just like compressed tubes of ignorant people. So I don't, I don't want to do that at all. And certainly I don't want to go through an immersive experience in terms of, uh, of actually confirming that I'm going to have to do that, uh, that journey in the future. Incidentally, the guy who came uh, to that user testing session um, bravely uh, to, to help us um, test this app was using a Windows phone. And funnily enough, I had never actually tested anything on a Windows phone um, because I was surrounded by people who had iPhones and Androids and they were readily available. And I guess part of me also just assumes that that's m what most people had. Nobody has a Windows phone, that would be silly. But this guy doesn't give a shit whether it's a Windows phone or an Android phone or whatever. He's just walked into a shop and he's picked up whatever's cheapest and whatever is just sort of visually pleasing to him at the time. It wasn't visually perfect, the app, on the, on the Windows phone. It didn't look, I mean, it couldn't look how I imagined because I never imagined anyone using it on a Windows phone. But it did look okay and it was usable and he was able to get through the task. And the reason was I hadn't done adaptive design. I hadn't actually tailored the design to those specific Apple devices that most people worry about. I just made it responsive. I'd used content breakpoints instead of device breakpoints. So I knew that it was going to be kind of malleable. It was going to be more inclusive of other interfaces. Now, to be really clear, I'm not suggesting that you should go out of your way to make stuff which is a bit off kilter and a bit ugly. But my point is, when you prioritize, you have to compromise. You have to weigh things up. You have to decide what's important. And the important thing in the web is to make sure that most people get a decent experience. That's more important than a few people getting an excellent experience. So you have to weigh that up and you have to make those kinds of compromises. There was a guy on Twitter um, recently, he was doing this thing where he was sort of sharing little 
sort of nuanced interface um, refinements. So for instance, he was doing this thing where he's saying, well, if you've got light text on a kind of a lightish background, then you can lift that by, uh, by giving it a subtle drop shadow like this. And I was doing that dickish thing that people do of quote tweeting and saying, well, this is, you know, that's all very nice for you, but um, actually people who have limited sight um, wouldn't be able to discern that in any way and you'd still have a, a um, contrast accessibility issue. So you're solving the wrong problem or you're not even solving a problem. And, you know, this, this would be better. It would, you know, you just change the background color so it's dark, right? Um, so yeah, I'm a bit of an arsehole because I was sort of picking on these things and someone pointed out that that wasn't very kind of me. But there's a reason why I get pissed off with stuff like that because it does make a difference for a few people. But we spend too much time worrying about those little differences when we've, we've not solved the main problems, the main, like the actual accessibility of it. So uh, I guess the conclusion to that is just that Basically, your priorities portray your privileges and your prejudices. So what you prioritize says a lot about you and about what you've experienced and about, um, about the kind of problems that you've encountered. Um, because if you think that you've got the space and you've got the, the time to worry about those tiny little refinements, then you've probably not had a life of crisis, I suppose. You, you've led a kind of a sheltered existence and you've not met people who... who uh, Who've, who've not otherwise uh, um, led a sheltered existence either. Um, so I started building this checklist recently because I figured that um, not by anyone's fault really, just through a lack of um, experience, we tend to uh, fall back on, on creating stuff for ourselves a lot. And I wanted to just create this grab bag of ideas and principles based around how you can just quickly begin to make interfaces um, alienate fewer people. So um, the inclusive web design checklist is available on GitHub and you can just, if you come up with ideas, things which affect you or just stuff that you think of and that you know is a problem and you don't see it in the list, add it. Um, there was some discussion over where, um, where we would actually um, draw the line in terms of uh, uh, maybe we should categorize different things in different ways, but no one could agree on that. Basically, the point is that all of this stuff should be should be priorities because it's all to do with making things work and be more understandable to more people. Uh, just a note on vanity uh, and specifically to do with code vanity. Um, so here's a bit of code. This this defines a a tab list um, with tabs in it. So for for creating a, a, a tab interface with ARIA, I suppose. Now, I remember a while ago, I was talking to a JavaScript engineer who I worked with, and I, I, I had added the semantics to make it an accessible, an accessible tab list. And his response was, um, I don't get it. That's, surely that's bad practice to do that. And I, I, I didn't understand what he meant. And he said, well, the code's just so much uglier now, isn't it? It's, it's more difficult to read. It's, it's more messier. And I kind of see what he means, but I guess because he was used to writing code which which ran on the server or or it didn't actually directly give anything to the user, then he was in this mode of thinking the readability was more important than the semantics. And of course, the semantics are really important. HTML is the interface. So adding those that semantics, even though it, it bloats things, um, can sometimes be important. Of course, you don't always need to use ARIA, and uh, there's a question mark over whether tab interfaces are very useful or understood by many people. But the point is, you should be adding code um, that makes a difference to the user. This would be redundant code, because you have a role of tab list and then you have a class of tab list, just because you've decided you wanna use classes in your CSS, means you are bloating things, because you're, you're adding stuff that doesn't need to be there. You can style stuff based on attribute selectors for, uh, for the different roles and things there. So you don't need to do that. But that's a kind of a minor point. The point is uh, you should add stuff where it's needed and make it a priority. So in terms of markup, a low priority would be doing uh, markup that's neat and tidy. A high priority would be markup that's accessible, right? Um, low priority, markup that's readable to developers. High priority, 
markup that's readable by assistive technologies. Low priority, managing CSS specificity, high priority, managing user experiences. So there's this vanity thing about CSS specificity because it makes us feel like we can't write CSS when we kind of get in a muddle over CSS specificity. Um, and the reason that we get into that muddle is not because CSS is broken, as um, Sergio um, wrote, I disagree with that. It's because we make interfaces which are too complex in the first place, um, with far too much um, heterogeneity, far, far too many different bits and pieces and feature creep. That's why CSS becomes a problem. If you make simple interfaces, then the CSS uh, you write will necessarily be terser. So he kind of did this weird cell phone in this article where he said, how many importance do you have in your project? You know, how many importance have you had to rely on to Trump specificity? And he shared the fact that he had 162 in his code. Now, that's sort of laughable as another coder. You just think, well, that just means that you can't write CSS very well. or you've, you, I mean, there's 34 fucking CSS files there for the first place. I mean, I don't remember the last time that I did a project with more than one CSS file. In any case, the importance being there does not directly affect the user. And finding out ways to get around that should therefore not be a priority. It's vanity. You don't want that important there because you're worried about what the next developer is going to think. Now, there is the, it is a sign that you've mismanaged your CSS and maybe it's less maintainable or whatever. But as I said, um, the main issue there is because the interface itself is far too complex. We have tried to get around the CSS specificity problem and inheritance problem, if, it, if you can call those uh, problems, um, with all sorts of things. We did object-oriented CSS um, a few years ago, then it became BEM, which is a kind of a really hardcore version of that. Then atomic CSS, which is just like literally every possible thing you could write in CSS defined in a class name. And then CSS and JS, which is where you kind of um, tie the CSS to the component that you're writing, which works for some people. Nothing wrong with any of these techniques or whatever. My concern is that we've spent so much time and energy worrying about this thing when we could have been working about the actual user experience. If we really wanted to solve the problem of CSS specificity, we would simply do this. We would turn all of our content into one giant image, do a map, and then define areas. That's what I used to do back in 2002 when I was um, first making websites. A big image, because it meant I could use the fonts I wanted to use, because this was before web fonts, and then just define little areas to draw around for the links. Completely and utterly inaccessible and hugely um, badly performing and all sorts of other issues because it's a giant fucking image. But it does solve the CSS specificity. I can't fucking say that word. The CS specificity problem. So if that's your one and only priority, fucking go ahead and do that. But of course it's not, or it shouldn't be. So uh, I'm going to wrap up. The good news is most of what you do isn't necessary, which is kind of depressing uh, to think back on all of the work maybe that, were, that we've collectively done and think that, well, actually, a lot of the things we worried about and a lot of the things we tried to do, just, you know, there was really no point. Uh, it didn't really make any difference to users. They either didn't notice or didn't care. Um, but the good thing about it means that as you move forward and you become better at prioritizing things, um, there's less to do and more time to do stuff with, you know, your family or whatever. Um, because life as a developer is short. Um, it, you know, it, once, you've, once you've done a few divs, that's it. And, uh, and it's game over. Um, but the good news is there is plenty of time to do the stuff that matters if you cut out the stuff which doesn't matter, the stuff which you deprioritize. And that can include, uh, you know, having a bit of fun. Um, so for instance, the Taylor Swift website. Now the problem with that was that it didn't do anything for the user whatsoever. It was just blank, you know, void, empty space. And yet it was 800 kilobytes. If you really prioritize the user, that would have been, it would still be a blank, black screen and it would only be, I don't know, three kilobytes or something similar to that, just for the little bit of markup and the, you wouldn't use JavaScript obviously to do the, uh, to do the color anyway. Um, and I, I experimented with this idea and I thought, well, if I wasn't doing the ad tracking business, which I shouldn't be doing really, um, then I could actually get away with doing all sorts of stuff on the page. I mean, this is just one 
uh, sort of speculative redesign that I came up with. I, I feel like it's on brand. It's all singing or dancing. It's got, you know, lots of great imagery and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's very Taylor Swift. Um, and that's 100K. So that's a fraction of the 800K. But there's something actually fucking there, you know? There's an actually, actually something to look at. So, uh, so yeah, eat that up. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of the best designs I think I've ever done. Um, and that's it, actually. That concludes me um, ranting, ranting on about stuff. So oh, my for- gosh. That is perfect and awesome <laughs> and horrible all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so, Certainly horrible, yeah. Thank you so much for uh, joining and giving us this uh, accessibility priority talk. First one is from I am uh, Bedges. Um, you describe scenario where developers and designers uh, justify the poor decisions they make in terms of avoiding clutter and, or being productive. Um, what about scenarios in which designers and developers are advocates of exactly what you've been speaking about, uh, but it's the business that's the blocker? What do you What do you do? Ah, uh, yeah. So um, that's a really good question. So. I think most of the time, see, whenever I do these talks, I'm sort of speaking to, to developers mostly because I'm a developer. So I'm a, I'm, I do that kind of work or I'm a designery developer. Uh, well, actually, I didn't even think that designers and developers should be seen as separate people as often as they are. But in any case, yeah, I, um, it's usually the business is the problem. Um, it's usually, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the sort of organizational dysfunction that is the reason that we create these really complex things and um and uh you know we get the feature creep and you get a sort of top-down decision making and everything and uh any organization which is genuinely committed to making their interface more inclusive more user-centered um i think you just you in terms of specifically the clutter problem ultimately you end up with something which is less cluttered just ultimately because you discover that users really don't want very much from you um, and they want what you know what you do do to be super um, super easy and simple as easy I guess but um yeah I think um, I mean I, I do a lot of auditing and quite a lot of the time when I when I'm looking at the code I'm not seeing bad like bad developers code like I, I know it's easy to sort of think, oh uh, well, they've they've screwed this up. They obviously don't know anything about accessibility or whatever. Um, but um, actually, most of the time, I think they were probably really rushed to change something um, which they weren't really happy with changing. But there was a lot of pressure, and there was a deadline, and so they, you know, it was a perfectly good radio group which they wanted to then add buttons to. So then that kind of turned into this mishmash of a component, and it no longer makes any sense to anyone. I've seen that so much. So I think a lot of the time it's kind of the organization, the organization and the way that the organization functions kind of, yeah, screws it up. And and despite, you know, the developers or the designers being very talented, but I think that um, in terms of accessibility and inclusive and sort of broader inclusive design, the more design that actually goes into the development, the better. And the more that that becomes part of the culture, uh, the, the, the more robust in, in lots of different ways uh, the output is. Yeah, so I, did the, I hope that answers more or less <laughs> the question. Yeah, I mean, that's something that you constantly get is somebody on high that read a great blog or uh, article about something and said, oh, that's what we need to do. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't let it go. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, yeah. That, that happens a lot. It's kind of, I think a, 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 lot of, a lot of the time people get into their heads that they're, that they're Facebook or they're Google. So what works for them should, um, should work for, for those people as well. And so it's just like, well, this is the thing to do. And I think that's another thing which is really powerful when you get it, you, you really commit to just choosing the things which are right for the job. You know, like I was saying, you know, if you're doing a blog, then it's all about, reading experience and it's all about performance um because you can afford for it to be performed because it should just be static content or it can just be static content and just doing things in a way that suits what you're trying to make i guess is an important thing yeah so so that whole thing of 
of just like, well, the cool kids are doing this, so we should do this. You know, you you end up in a situation where you're doing a client rendered React based blog, which is just not the way to do it. It's not compatible, I guess. What would be the one takeaway that you'd want somebody to get out of this talk today? Like how would they take what you presented and like apply it? Um, I think just, just to think about priorities and just to, um, the one that like the one lesson that I think like I feel most passionate about, passionate about as I say it, as I'm explaining it in the talk is this idea of, just because something could be measured doesn't mean it's important. So you really have to actually cut things. You can't, you can't afford to say, well, this is actually doing good. You have to say, well, if it's not doing enough good, then we don't do it. We prioritize something else and we, and we, we focus on another area. So I think that's the main thing is just, and then when you actually think about what you're doing, which is creating interfaces, you're actually creating things which real people have to use then you have to conclude that actually the inclusive element of it or the accessibility of it is paramount. It's a really important thing. It's not just catering to, to, uh, to a very few um, outliers. Um, that's a sort of one of those misconceptions of accessibility. It's like, well, it's a lot of cost to, um, to do all of that work for just a few blind people or, or whatever group it is that you're obsessing over. When actually, we're all divided into different groups where we have different uh, different needs essentially, and that's why that's why I like to talk about inclusive design rather than accessibility because it's more about like if you add up all of the different groups, which you can one way or another sort of arbitrarily de define as a group of people that face a a certain problem, then you you it's actually m most people or almost all people. Um, have those kinds of um, challenges in one way or another so you're just making things for people um, yeah so just cutting out um, cutting out the stuff which doesn't make much difference uh, and it's, it's sort of like an 80 20 rule thing you know like 20% uh, of the effort for 80% of the outcome that kind of thing and then you save time and then you can move on to another project right <laughs> and, and do that one really quite well but not try and obsess over it and try and make it perfect yeah, I think that ties into a question that Adam Silver asked earlier too, is how, so th that's great and we all agree with that, but how do you actually convince people to prioritize those things over their own non-problem priorities? Um, okay. Maybe yeah. like beyond maybe the business um, argument. Yeah, so the, the I guess it, it, in terms of inclusive design, the, the business argument, just to cover that first, would be, as I said, you know, if you add up all of the different disabilities or the different challenges which people face, then that is sort of everyone. So the idea is to make it as flexible as possible, I suppose. It's, I, I use an expression in the book, which is about the, less, the, the fewer decisions you make for the user, then um, the more they can make for themselves, you know, the more they can adjust the interface and the more that they can, they can have things to their liking. Um, but actually trying to convince people that their, um, that their problems are, uh, the, 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 the problems that they're coming up with or the things that they want to change in the interface, that those little kind of pointless pixely perfecting iterations are not important and try and like defeat that culture. Um, you just have to be good at argumentation. Um, you have to get good at, at, at kind of pointing out fallacious argumentation and the way that people try and justify how to do things. I actually did a, an article on my blog a while ago called Developer Fallacies, which is about, um, about um, kind of spotting and seeing through the kind of false justifications people use for things like the, on two sides of the same coin, you have the one which is, one which I call the gospel fallacy, which is we've always done it this way. So, um, so it must be good sort of thing, which is obviously, it doesn't follow, so it's a fallacy. And the other way around, which is as we were just, we were just chatting about a minute ago, uh, the thing of um, uh, uh, where you just adopt something new just because it's new, the fallacy that because it's a new thing, it must be better than the old thing. So getting good at actually standing up for saying, well, actually, I, you know, I don't think you're justifying this well enough for us to go down this path. And that does mean confrontation and, 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 and um, 
I don't know, uh, uh, getting in, getting into awkward situations to some extent. But unfortunately, that that is part of it. It's like any other job. It's it's really not about the code. It's more about um, it's more about human interaction. Sadly. <laughs> Yeah, no, that makes sense. Thank you. And I posted a link in the chat to that um, article that you just mentioned to the fallacies one. Oh, cool. Um, nice one. So just wrapping up, is there any other last minute questions anybody has? Otherwise, uh, we'll hopefully see you all in uh, January in the new year. We'll have a new speaker and a new topic. But for now, I, I'm so excited. Um, I think that a lot of people here in the in the room you know, look up to you as somebody who, you know, we can learn from and grow and expand and kind of go off from some of your It's ideas. all about learning from each other. You know, we don't, I mean, I don't think Steve Faulkner is really good at this. He, he, he knows, he's like an oracle, you know, I, he's the person I always go to if I don't know something about some specific thing about ARIA or whatever. But then, you know, he doesn't know everything, no one does. And so it's just important to, uh, be brave enough to admit when you don't know and to be willing to say do you know what shit i don't i don't know this and so ask <laughs> yeah awesome well thank you so much thank you everyone cheers everyone cheers carrie thank you very much take care see you cheers bye